Welcome to the September 8th meeting of the Glendale City Council. May we have a roll call, please? Council members Drayman. Here. Friedman. Here. Najarian. Here. Weaver. Here. Mayor Quintero. Here. The flag <laughs> salute this evening will be led by Council Member Drayman and the invocation by the city clerk. You would all please stand. Place your right hand after your heart and salute our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Shall we bow our heads? This evening we pray for peace and safety in this lovely community. Let us take this opportunity to remember our firefighters and others who were fighting the SoCal wildfires, and especially those who have paid the ultimate price in their effort to save the lives and property of others. As we approach the anniversary of September 11th tragedy, we ask that the souls of all lost lives be forever remembered. Finally, we ask that you guide our council in exercising wisdom in all their decisions. Thank you. Madam Clerk, may we have your report? <clears throat> the agenda for the September 8, 2009 regular meeting of the Glendale City Council was posted on Thursday, September 3rd, 2009 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Next, please. At item 3 comes presentations and appointments. At 3A is the agenda review for the, meeting, the meetings of September 15, 2009. Mr. Starbird. Yes, I'll go to Suzette. Suzette Mullins for the staff report. Suzette. Thank, thank you, Mr. Starbird. Um, housing, uh, there's no agenda items for the Housing Authority meeting. Uh, there's no agenda items for the Redevelopment Agency meeting. We do have a, a joint public meeting for the Glendale City Council and the Glendale Redevelopment Agency. Director of Development Services requests from the Harley Davidson Love Ride Foundation for co sponsor of the 26th annual Love Ride uh, fundraising event. For the council meeting, our action items uh, fire chief status regarding the station fire, uh, general manager of Glendale Water and Power, lease agreement for the lease of the portion of city owned property located at 900 North Glendale Avenue. Uh, we also have the general manager of the Glendale Water and Power Titan Hydropower Project uh, power sales and acquisition contract with the Southern California Public Power Authority. We have a hearing uh, for Director of Planning, Glendale Register of Historic Resource Listing for the property at 1758 Roar Street. We also have another hearing, Director of Planning, Glendale Register of Historic Resource Listing for the property at 1020 Hillcroft Road. And that concludes the agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next. At item 3B, <coughs> pardon me, is the renaming of the sports complex to Ron Gray Sports Complex. There's a proclamation. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, actually, I thought it was the Verdugo Power Academy. I was told that no, to 3B, that. that would be 3B. Okay, great. All right, if the uh, people who are here to receive the proclamation, perhaps they can come to the uh, podium. Uh, point of order. Is this an agenda item? I never saw this. If, if it was just given to me. It, it, well, if it's a mayor's commendation, that's one thing. But if this is, uh, and, and then the way she stated it was the renaming of one of our parks. That would be required to be on oh, uh, the agenda. It's not what this is. Roosevelt Middle School. It's a proclamation for a gentleman <clears throat> who uh, right, right, right. passed away in the um, train. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, Mr. Mayor. Well, absolutely fine. Yeah. Could you reread the item again? Just to clarify what is going on is that the, the Glendale Unified is going to Whereas Ron Grace grew up in the neighborhoods and playgrounds of Glendale and attended Glendale Community College at San Diego State University, 
Ryan, Ron began his career working at Roosevelt Middle School in 1985 as a coach, history teacher, and the head counselor of the school. His charismatic and caring personality touched the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of students, her families, and staff members. Ron Grace lived each and every day in accordance with his deeply held convictions, principles, and beliefs. He devoted his days to being a wonderful husband and father and to helping his students develop the skills and positive attitude necessary to achieve their goals and attain their dreams. He loved sports and was an exceptional quarterback in high school. He always cheered for his favorite team, the San Diego uh, Chargers. Whereas Ron Grace and 24 others were killed when a commuter train collided with a Union Pacific freighter on September 12, 2008, hundreds of friends, family, and students gathered at his memorial service to honor his uh, life. Ron's wife, Jan, sons Brian and Andrew, and his five siblings, and many friends, co-workers, and students mourn his passing and remember him for the good and kind man that he was. The superintendent of Glendale Public Schools, Michael Escalante, and the members of the Board of Education will rename Roosevelt Middle School's gym and field the Ron Grace Sports Complex on September 11, 2009, in honor of Ron's dedication and inspiration to the students of Roosevelt Middle School. Therefore, I, Frank Quintero, mayor of the city of Glendale, on behalf of the entire Glendale City Council, hereby join in honoring Ron Grace's life and celebrating the renaming of Roosevelt Middle School and Jim, the Ron Grace Sports Complex, a remembrance of his life, values, and his monumental legacy of motivation and inspiration to all of those who were privileged to know him. On behalf of uh, Roosevelt Middle School staff and community, my name is Lynn Marso, and I'm the proud principal at Roosevelt Middle School. And this is Maurice James, uh, one of uh, my assistant principals. We greatly appreciate and thank you for doing this. And this Friday, September 11th at 8.30 a.m., the entire staff and uh, former staff and community members and our Joylene Wagner, our Board of Education member, will be um, honoring the Grace family who will be there to hear the proclamation and accept this and also a plaque in the dedication of the sports complex in his honor. So thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to add my thanks on behalf of the board. I want to thank you, Ms. Wagner, and Rick Reyes, who I know was also instrumental in and help you with the proclamation. All right, next item. And item 3C is Verdugo Power Academy presentation. Uh, good evening, Mayor Quintero, members of the council. I'm here tonight along with members from Verdugo Workforce Investment Board and the Glendale Community College to introduce you to the Verdugo Power Academy. Our first official class will start on September 21st, uh, 2009. Uh, how this project or program came about, uh, two years ago I met with the Glendale Community College staff and I asked them if there's a way we can put together a program that would help us uh, train our local residents on utility business, on the works that we do for utility. Apparently at that time we're finding out that not too many people really, really realize how good of a career you can have with a utility. Uh, and so we, we, we tried to work with them and try to figure out means where we can start training from our community to work for the local community. Like I said, it started about two years ago and we have been brainstorming on how we can get this about until about July of 2009 when Verdugo Web informed us that there's some stimulus money available to start a program like this. And so we applied, filled out an application, went through a, an interview process, and they selected this program as one of the projects or programs that they want to fund using the Obama Stimulus Fund. Uh, 
So they granted us $174,000, and now the hard work really starts well to make it work. So we're here to present to you that we think that this program is another example where a local community plus a local utility and, and the city itself can work together with its resources in order to to develop more of our, our residents or our community members into com contributing uh, members of the uh, uh, community. So with that, I'd like to introduce some of the partners we have with us. A lot of people from Glendale Community College, and I'll let them introduce them. But I'd like to start with Rich Roach. He's the chairman of VWIB, and talk a little bit about, about the program. And after that, we'll have Mr. Vahe Perumian, the president of the Glendale Board of Trustees. Uh, good evening. My name is Rich Roach. I'm with AT&T, but tonight I'm representing the Verdugo Workforce Investment Board. I'm the chairperson. Um, I have a whole lot of comments, but bottom line is Ramon sort of went through most of them. Uh, bon uh, we, the WIB got quite a bit of stimulus money from the federal government, and we're trying to find ways to put people back to work, and it's doing training, trying to figure out what jobs are going to be out there. So uh, we put out an RFP, about 20 different programs responded, and of that, we went through a review process, and the Power Academy came out number one. And it's based on three reasons. The first one, it's talking about training, good quality training, that puts people back to work. The second one is the fact that there's a job, a critical job shortage of power technicians throughout the region. Uh, here in Glendale, Pasadena, Burbank, through LA, these are good jobs and there's a need for them. The third one is that this training brings, it's green jobs because it's creating a skilled workforce to work on power grids, uh, smart grids, as well as uh, power conservation. So they're great jobs. Uh, we're able to bring $274,000 worth of monies to this effort. Additionally, the WIB is looking at, and we're applying for additional grants for a continuation and expansion of the program. Uh, we're putting in for a million dollars to the California Department of Energy and a few others. So hopefully we can continue to grow, grow the program. So it's a great program. It's the right thing at the right time. So thank you for uh, letting us be part of this. Good evening. My name is Vahe Perumian, and I'm the uh, president of the Glendale College Board of Trustees. And for the second time this summer, I'm appearing in front of you to strengthen the ties between the college and the community it represents. Uh, this is a great occasion for us. Um, it's been a tough year for community colleges. We've been in the news for the uh, big or small cuts that we were going to take. In fact, we, were gonna, we are going to end this year with 3,000 unfunded students. So we have a year where everyone wants to go to back to school to get retrained, to uh, obtain new skills, to re-enter the workforce, which is shrinking. But uh, we're taking everyone we can. And this is yet another way where we are uh, approaching uh, the community and saying that we're here for you that we will look at every program where we can, no matter how big or how small, where we can strengthen the ties and increase our input into this community and uh, serve our community even better. I'd like to introduce some of the people we've got here today. I've got three other members of the Board of Trustees here, Dr. Armina Hakopian, our clerk, uh, Mr. Tony Tartaglia, and uh, Ms. Anne Ransford, and absent today, but here in spirit is uh, Mrs. Anita Quinones Gabrielian, who's our vice president. We also have Dr. Don Lindsay, the president of the college, and several members of the administration in the audience. So, what I'd like to do is to present you with two plaques that we've prepared. They're nearly identical, but this one reads, in appreciation to the Glendale City Council and the Verdugo Workforce Investment Board for partnership to train the future workforce in the Glendale Power Academy from the Glendale Community College Board of Trustees, September 2009. And this is nearly identical, except it identifies the Glendale Water and Power Department. And Mr. Quintero, if I could have you take these. And this one is for your, for your offices. Right. And we'd also like to invite you to the official kickoff or uh, launch, which will take place sometime in early October when uh, Congressman Schiff will be available and he'll be present at that uh, ceremony as well. And thank you very much for your time.
Can I just say that that is a beautiful poster? <laughs> so it almost looks like a. This was designed by uh, one of our art instructors at the college. Terrific. Almost rest reminiscent of a WPA. Uh, yeah, it's gorgeous. It's got that look. We, uh, so, yeah. That vintage uh, appeal. It's great. Thank you very much. I'll let Thank you. Okay. Next, please. And item four are city council or staff comments. Mr. Weaver. Yeah, I, I have to apologize for forgetting to uh, thank the uh, firemen for what they did while in Glen Oaks Canyon while I was on vacation and ultimately what they've been doing with the station fire. Um, it's hard to explain adequately how much they have meant to this city, but I thought I would throw one other thing in to it. Um, if one more idiotic gadfly stands up here and has the nerve to say the policemen deserve the pay they get, but the firemen don't because they lounge around the firehouse, I will cut them off at the pass, tell them off, and or leave the council chambers. Uh, there's an article that was in the paper just recently, and it says about firefighters, as it turns out, a firefighter's heart always stays on the job. Firefighters have a much higher risk of suffering a heart attack going to, being at, or after a fire. It's physical stress as well as mental stress. Police and paramedic workers have the same risks. So for anybody to stand up here in front of this council and to say on TV that the firefighters who have been pounded on endlessly by gadflies here don't deserve our admiration and respect for what they do, to think they're being overpaid, just look what they've done for us. And that shouldn't be lost on us ever. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Entrance. What an entrance. Um, Mr. Weaver, don't forget uh, backs, shoulders, necks, elbows, and knees. Oh, yeah. They're also part of the profession. Pack. Weights up? Yes. Uh, anyone else? Mr. Dream? Okay. I, um, in addition to thanking the firefighters, um, actually I had an opportunity to drive around La Crescenta, Tahanga, up Angeles Crest till the uh, roadblock. And uh, all I can say is we were so lucky as a community, La Crescenta uh, and uh, La Cañada, that there weren't any uh, structures lost or even lives other than the two firefighters, obviously. But, I mean, regionally, we were just extremely lucky because that burnt area is literally into the backyards of the, uh, of the homes. I want to also thank the uh, Glendale PD, the captain, lieutenant, sergeants, and patrol personnel involved with the Michael Jackson uh, funeral. They did a, an excellent job of putting everything to, uh, together. The uh, media, there was literally three quarters of a mile of satellite trucks, cameras, print media, and everything associated with the uh, funeral. And uh, they were quite happy that the police got everything going uh, functioning well. I think the residents uh, did okay. They were allowed in and out access to their homes as well as the, uh, the business people. But uh, anyway, I just think the, uh, well, I guess they're showing some of the uh, video, yeah. So uh, they just did an excellent job. And um, Mr. Mayor, do we know, did they eat? And shop in Glendale while they were here? Uh, actually, I was there in the morning and then uh, went back in the afternoon and evening, and absolutely they were all, I'm sure, the little restaurants surrounding uh, Forest Lawn must have done real well because they were all eating and drinking commercial, you know, products that they, uh, that they bought. And uh, as I mentioned in the uh, news press, I mean, there, were liter there was coverage, uh, international coverage, three uh, British... Uh, uh, channels, uh, all of the different uh, European, from Russia to Southern Europe, 
uh, South America, South Africa, Asia, China, Japan, Taiwan. So it was quite a bit of uh, coverage for the uh, city of Glendale and the uh, funeral. And I do also want to add that um, the city of Glendale did not pay a dime for these uh, services. They, we contracted with Forest Lawn. The expenditure is an estimated 120000 to 140000 and it will be covered by Forest Lawn, and obviously they'll be reimbursed by the... Uh, by the Jackson uh, estate. So uh, that's it. All right, next please. Item 5A through C are consent items. They are routine and may be acted upon by one motion. Any member of council or the audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such requests before motion is proposed. I have a motion, Mr. Mayor, move the consent calendar. Second. Roll call. Council members Drayman. Yes. Friedman. Yes. Najarian. Yes. Weaver. Aye. Mayor Quintero. Yes. Next, please. Item six are oral communications. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Council may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. The city manager may refer the matter to the appropriate department for investigation and report. Okay, you'll be allowed to uh, speak for three minutes in this portion of oral communications, basically for announcements. We'll start with Ross Paulson, followed by Helen McDonald. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council and uh, Mr. Starboard and Mr. Howard. Uh, my name is Ross Paulson and I am the Assistant Regional Commissioner for Glendale's AYSO program. Uh, briefly, uh, we have quite a few number, quite a few kids uh, in the program this year. We have about 3,700 kids this year in the program and uh, which is just slightly up from last year. There's a little bit more. Uh, it's nice to see a few more smiling faces out there. We have over a thousand uh, volunteers. I don't even know how many training sessions we've run this year. We've run uh, uh, five safe haven uh, programs where we deal with child protection. We've done at least uh, five major ca coaching uh, clinics which deal with uh, separate courses for a number of coaches uh, and we've done at least uh, five referee clinics all of these people including myself including the uh, regional commissioner are all volunteering their time to spend out there with the kids on the field and we also have other parents that help with regard to the program uh, the reason I'm coming here tonight is uh, to make a special in-person uh, invitation to all of you to attend our opening day ceremony which is this Sunday uh, Sunday at 6 o'clock at the Glendale City College and uh, at, at the opening ceremony all of the teams are there represented and they all, all of the kids are wearing their basically brand new uniforms and they uh, have a banner. Each kid, uh, each team has a banner with their team sponsor. The kids' names are are on the banner, and it has their like team logo, uh, which can be anything if you could imagine. Because we have kids from who are under five to under nineteen, it could be almost anything. Anyways, um, I'm. I just would uh, ask that if you could please come down to Glendale uh, City College uh, if you are there uh, maybe you can uh, say something with regard to uh, what's going on uh, maybe say hi to all of the parents and uh, people that are there uh, just with regard to one small item that Mr. Weaver mentioned uh, which was the firemen uh, I have one of those brave firemen daughters on my team and uh, many times he he's not always able to make all of the games because he of his his duties he's not always there and uh, I want to thank him and many of the and all of the other firemen who did save our homes thank you thank you 
It's a wonderful event, just watching all the cute little kids in their outfits so excited about opening day. It's quite, a, quite an event. Helen McDonough, followed by Susie Jacobs. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and City staff. My name is Helen McDonough. I'm uh, from Massage NV Glendale, and I'm here to make an announcement about an event next Tuesday, September 15th, called Massage for the Cure. It's an annual one-day event presented by Massage Envy. There will be over 590 locations in 40 states participating in this event. Um, many of you know that um, some of the facts from the National Cancer Institute is that in 2009 alone, there will be 192,000 new cases of breast cancer in the U.S., and more than 1,900 of those will be men diagnosed with the disease. Of these, more than 40,000 women will die, and more than 440 men will succumb to breast cancer. So please come out on Tuesday, September 15th. The cost of the fundraiser is $35 for a one-hour therapeutic massage, $10 of which will be donated to the local affiliate of the Susan G. Komen for the cure. Additional donations will be accepted and are greatly appreciated. Um, we are currently taking reservations at 818-246-3689. Um, we are um, doing massages from 7.30 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. And we hope to um, beat the leading clinic, which right now is in Chicago, that has 159 massages scheduled for that day. So I want to show them that Glendale, California, um, is the number one clinic. And we want you all to come out and get massages that day. Tell your friends and family. Again, the number is 818-246-3689. Thank you very much. Thank you. Susie Jacobs, followed by Leon Mayer. Mr. Mayor, council members, esteemed panelists up here, hello. So after you massage your body, you can come and massage your uh, political voice. Assemblymember Paul Krikorian, my boss, is hosting a Safe Streets workshop on the September 15th from 7 until 8 p.m. at the Buena Vista Library in Burbank. That's 300 North Buena Vista. He has a bill, AB 766, about safe streets. In Burbank, police department's own Carl Povolitis has been really instrumental. I watch you. I follow the articles in the paper. I know that speeding, public safety, local control over speed limits is an important issue. And we are holding a public workshop and forum. There will be representatives from the state and local law enforcement. So I'm inviting everybody in Glendale, 7 until 8 o'clock next Tuesday night, Buena Vista Library in Burbank. It's not too far. You can take Glen Oaks, safe Glen Oaks, and come on down and make your voice known to RSV, please. VP, please contact Anita Avakian in our office, 818-558-3043. No one will be turned away if you didn't RSVP. You could also go to the website, or you can email Anita directly, anita.avakian at asm.ca.gov. Thank you so much. Thank you. Leon Mayer, followed by Colin Legerton. Good evening, Mayor Quintero, members of the council and staff. My name is Leon Mayer, and I'm here on behalf of the library and the friends of the Glendale Public Library to give you a last uh, announcement about our next event, which is Millennium Makeover. Uh, your space, YouTube, my space, YouTube, and the future of American politics. Hi, the, the author is Mike, Michael Hayes. And Mr. Hayes is a national expert on communication. He served for 20, 25 years in the field of cons consultation with television stations, charter communications, uh, entertainment, to survey uh, what the people who watched these programs were thinking, were doing, what, what they wanted. And that's what resulted him in his writing this book, Millennium Makeover. It's a famous book, and it preceded the Obama uh, election. And 
He will be there to talk about his book, to answer questions, and to talk to particularly people who are now called millennials. A millennial is anybody who was born between 1982 and 2003. And this is the ge generation that he's talking about, but I like to think there's more people voting uh, and will be voting than just the millennial uh, 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 people. In any event, this event will be at the Central Library this Thursday, 7 o'clock. It's free. You're, you'll be able to listen, ask questions, and in view of the recent uh, turmoil going on in Washington now, there might be a lot of questions that people want to ask, and he'll be there to answer them. So uh, we're looking forward to you being there on the uh, 10th of September. Now, uh, I have somebody with me who is not going to be there, but he's going to be there on the 17th of April, 7 o'clock at the Glendale Public Library. And he is an author. He happens to be born, raised in the Glendale area, going to school here and went to Tufts University. And then he took a great, magnificent journey of 14,000 miles into China. And I could talk more about it than maybe he could, but I'm going to turn you over to Colin Ledgerton, the son of Victor Ledgerton, the uh, father of the uh, Duck Splash. And Colin, would you come forward and address the, the group and talk about your uh, program coming up? Yeah, okay, thank we'll you. start a new time for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Quintero, City Council members and staff. Um, as Leon so eloquently introduced me, my name is Colin Ledgerton. I was born and raised here in Glendale, but more recently I've spent uh, a few years in China. And among that time I spent in China, I spent a few months with a friend traveling around the border regions of China, which are inhabited by ethnic minorities quite different from what you normally think of as Chinese. So we spent some time on buses and trains along those areas trying to learn some about the culture and the languages. And uh, then my friend and I wrote this book, Invisible China, which came out this year. And uh, now I have a couple events coming up soon to promote it and be able to share it with the local community. Uh, this Thursday at 7, I'll be talking at Flintridge Bookstore up in La Cunada. And then next Thursday, the 17th, thanks to Leon Mayer and the wonderful people at the Glendale Public Library, I will have an event with a slideshow full of pictures and uh, stories and signings of the book at the Glendale Central Library. And in addition to those few months traveling around the border regions, I spent a couple years living in Urumqi among the Uyghurs, who are one of the ethnic minorities in China. And I actually happened to live in the very part of Urumqi where all the riots happened a couple months ago. So I hope with that time at the Glendale Central Library, I'll be able to bring in a little insight on what those riots were about, as well as some of the cultures we encountered along our travels through China. So that at the Glendale Central Library will be next Thursday, September 17th at 7 p.m., and I hope you all can make it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, I won't be in town. Otherwise, I would absolutely be there. It's a fascinating book. I'm planning on buying it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, next, uh, we've got Dad. Victor. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mayor Contero, uh, members of the City Council, and staff. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of Glendale Kiwanis and the 5th Annual Kiwanis Incredible Duck Splash. We thank you for your co-sponsorship of the event. In the first four years, uh, over $300,000 was raised for the participating organizations, nonprofits, and schools. And uh, this Friday at the uh, Americana Brand, uh, we will have our opening of the uh, Glendale Duck Season, 1245, with uh, dignitaries. I know uh, uh, you've been uh, invited and hope some of you can be there. Uh, we will also have the uh, Chris Santa Valley High School Marching Band and the uh, several high schools' uh, bands will also be uh, participating in the uh, race day on October 24th. And uh, we will also have coverage this year of both the opening day and the race day from CBS2 and KKL9. So that we hope that particularly some of the top nonprofits, which have been uh, raising uh, five to ten thousand dollars, and we hope a lot more this year, uh, will be uh, getting some exposure on TV as well as the excellent coverage 
we've been getting from the Glendale News Press and the uh, local printed media. Uh, we're uh, certainly pleased to have uh, some uh, outstanding sponsorship again from uh, Baxter Healthcare, the uh, Healthcare Foundation at uh, Glendale Memorial Hospital, or at uh, Glendale Adventist Hospital, the Glendale Memorial Health Foundation, uh, CM Joseph, um, uh, Patricia Alamon's uh, State Farm uh, Insurance Agency, and Store It All to help underwrite uh, the uh, costs of the duck race so that the full amount of the adoptions will, between the organizations and the Glendale Kiwanis Foundation grants, be going back into the community. Uh, we strongly encourage the support of these many organizations, particularly considering, considering the uh, constrained budgets that they're all encountering this year, and we ex especially expect to have many more schools participating, uh, perhaps over 20 of our uh, Glendale Unified School District, as well as uh, many private schools. Uh, we expect that it will be as much fun as uh, we've had in the past, and I know some of you have been to the duck race. Uh, uh, it's uh, rather unusual. Uh, we expect uh, to uh, grow in spite of the economy. I just learned that Sunday's 15th annual Cincinnati Duck Race, which is the largest in the U.S. at this time, uh, finally got past their 80,000 goal and reached uh, 100,000 ducks. And we hope someday to be able to do that with a large number of groups participating. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, encourage the public, uh, particularly those that are approached by some of the uh, uh, participating nonprofits and schools, to uh, adopt ducks either with the forms or online at ducksforkids.com. And uh, information is also there if additional organizations want to uh, register and uh, become a part of the flock. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, next, please. At item, excuse me, at item seven, our adoption of ordinances seven A is the ordinance amending sections of Title Two of the GMC pertaining to the terms of office of members of boards and commissions and the composition of two boards and commissions. It was introduced by um, Councilmember Draymond on September one, two thousand nine. Mayor. I'd like to inquire if um, <clears throat> uh, I assume that 7A and 7B have to be introduced, uh, have to be voted on separately, I assume, because one is an urgency ordinance, the other is, is an ordinance. In addition, they're unrelated. 7, yeah. 7B is lease of property. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'll, uh, I will move uh, 7A. Second. Okay, I have one speaker card, Jolene Wagner. Good evening, Council. Joylene Wagner here. I came to the meeting as a member of the Board of Education to thank you to be here present when you made the proclamation for Ron Grace. He was a counselor for two of our children and, and a friend to me. Um, but, I'm, but I'm here on this issue, issue because I am an Arts and Culture Commissioner. And I would just, because I haven't perhaps read the details as closely as I should, ask you to consider as you look at the item that currently under this the seven person commission one of those seats is designated as a representative of the Glendale Unified School District that's the seat I have been serving on doesn't have to be a board member uh, but I'm not sure how that position would continue in the five-person format, and, and I would just ask you to consider that whoever gets that appointment might, I would hope, as a board member, a school board member, confer with the district so that, so that we maintain that relationship between the school district and the Arts and Culture Commission so long as the Arts and Culture Commission exists as commission. That's all. Mr. Draymond. Um. Mr. Howard, we uh, we have a number of Title II boards or commissions, Sir. Uh, more than one anyway, that have uh, particular requirements or uh, of that sort. For example, uh, well, we've already done DRB, but DRB has requirements as to, as to a number of architects or, or uh, uh, landscape architects. We also have, uh, I believe, uh, with... Uh, 
Is it TPC? TPC is another. Yeah. That's so this and this was discussed actually, um, and uh, uh, during the debate that we had, and I think it is doable. Uh, it, it's not only doable, it, the qualifications that exist in the current ordinance roll over into this ordinance that has not been changed. All it does is reduce the seven members to five, but the qualifications that one member has to be a member of the Board of Education or Glendale Community College still has to remain. Uh, or a representative of the yes, district in, in some way. And the language has not changed when it comes to the qualifications for this board. I think um, in my experience coming to this appointment, the how that happens is, is a bit of a mystery, I, I think. There, we, we certainly had cooperation in in my appointment, and I thank you for that. It's it's has been an interesting ride, and I'll we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Any other comments? Roll call. Council members: Drayman. Yes. Friedman. Yes. Najarian. Yes. Weaver. Aye. And Mayor Contero. Yes. Next, please. And Item 7B is an urgency ordinance authorizing and approving a lease of real property located at 116 West California Avenue to Glendale Arts, offered on September 1st, 2009, by Councilmember Drayman. Mr. Mayor, I will move 7B. Second. Any comments? Roll call. Council Members Drayman, yes. Friedman, yes. Najarian, yes. Weaver, Aye. Mayor Quintero. Yes. Next one. At item 8A, Director of Human Resources regarding proposed ordinance of the City of Glendale providing for a salary supplement and continuation of certain benefits for city employees who are members of the National Guard or Armed Forces re Reserves and are called up for active duty. And at 8A1 is an ordinance for introduction. Mr. Starbird, you want to give us just a quick... Yes, Mr. Mayor, the, the title that uh, Rita read does a nice job of summarizing. In effect, this extends from a 30-day limit to a maximum of one year, both salary and benefit supplements for those people who are actively called or are called up for active duty in any branch of the armed service while uh, employees of the city. I might note this is the eighth year in which you've extended this benefit. I might also note that uh, it's been a catastrophe for many of the uh, reservists and National Guard uh, uh, service members who have been uh, recalled time after time on active duty, and there are very few employers that uh, provide these type of uh, benefits. Mr. Weaver? I'm glad to introduce the ordinance at 8A1. Okay, any other comments? The ordinance has been introduced. Next, please. Item, item 8B, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Community Services regarding proposed Pacific Pool Development Project at Pacific Park. At 8B1 is a motion amending the existing contract with RJM Design Group, Inc., contract number 104371, adding design development construction document, bidding, construction, administration phases, and lead certification to the contract for the amount of $551,400 and authorizing the city manager to execute the amendment for a total not to exceed $644,050. Mr. Chapkin. Yes, briefly what I'd like to do is I'd like to call up Dave Ahern, the Capital Projects Administrator, who will give a brief report and then we'll take any questions that you have. Uh, but basically this is a follow-up to the March 31st Council uh, item. Dave. <coughs> Mayor Contero, members of the Council, the report before you tonight is an amendment to an existing contract with the RJM Design Group for the design of the Pacific Park Pool Project. Uh, the proposed design is what Council directed when we last brought this to you earlier this year, and that's for a six-lane L-shaped uh, design pool. We anticipate the project will come within the $6 million budget that we discussed, and that would include uh, the proposed contract amendment that's before you tonight. Um, the, this um, contract amendment provides for the design for the pool. Um, it also includes lead design, uh, which was one of the directives from Council. So the goal is to reach a lead silver design with this pool project. 
Um, we've added, or RJM has added a new consultant uh, to the aquatics design team for the project. Um, we think this consultant's going to give us a stronger voice and vision in terms of designing the pool elements that council desires. So we uh, have outlined a 24-month schedule uh, for the project in the report before you. Uh, that would complete it in the fall of 2011. That's simply a rough estimate of the schedule. Our goal and uh, the direction for my boss is to get it done by the end of May in 2011 to have it ready for that summer. So that's our target, which would be closer to 18 months, and we think it's achievable. So we have the the uh, the architects are here. The pool consultant is here. Staff is here. Uh, recreation staff is here to talk about the ongoing operational uh, aspects and programming of the pool, and we're ready to answer any questions you might have. I thought you were going to say I'm fired up and ready to go. <laughs> I'm fired up and ready to go. We're going to make him wear his speedos every day between now and when it's done. Got him on. Comments, questions, <laughs> Mr. Nigerian. <clears throat> Just a few questions, uh, Mr. Ahern. The um, the contract amendment amount uh, five hundred fifty one thousand is um, within the preliminary budget that you had over. Uh, That's correct. It's, it's within the estimated six million dollar budget that we presented. Because the scope uh, of their original contract now is being extended to actually do the design. That's correct. Features of the pool. All of the engineering, construction drawings, uh, lead design uh, was something that we hadn't anticipated. We've added and we've kept the cost down in terms of the consultant is. is and there's a lead component as well that we yes, absolutely. That we discussed about. So, um, how deep is the pool going to be? We can. Um, Answer that for you with uh, with my answer, or I can have the design consultant come up and answer it. S me, start. They, are there different answers. Would they be the same answer? <laughs> <laughs> why, don't they, we, why don't we test you and see? Yeah, they they would be the same answers. The pool starts out at a shallow end at about uh, two to three feet, and then uh, the t the deepest section of the pool is about ten feet. Yeah, ten feet, and. Uh, more shallow area than deep area, uh, and, and this pool, um, as we've discussed before, attempts to serve many masters, so it's got recreational aspects to it. Uh, there'll be some ability to do diving in this pool with a recreational diving board, um, not a not a competition board. You'll be able to, to swim, um, have competition swimming there in terms of um, you know starting block dives. Uh, you'll be able to practice water polo in this facility for recreational use, but not competition use. The, um, the two-foot area is in that uh, side. Uh, it's really at the, pool, at the end of the uh, L, and it's where the steps are to provide instructional area for, for children and also for seniors. So it's really the steps, is that shallowest in. When will we see this uh, again as a council? We would probably be back to you with design development drawings, I would estimate, by January. Or sooner. Obviously, please keep us abreast in case any one of us sees something that warrants a change or a comment. Sure. We can give our input. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're very confident with this design team and the new aquatics consultant. He's doing the, uh, the design for the reconstruction of both pools in the city of Burbank currently. Um, one is a six million dollar project. The other is seven and a half million dollars. McCambridge Park and Verdugo Park. Uh, he's also done. Uh, Burbank um, has two pools. Yes, they do. And uh, he's doing a number of, or he's done a number of pool projects in Los Angeles and Los Angeles County. So he's got a quite a quite a um, resume of of projects and experience. So um, we feel confident that we can bring you the project that you want. Okay, well, this is very exciting, Mr. Ahern, and um, I know you do bring, bring projects on time and, and under budget. That's Absolutely. Your, uh, this isn't the first, uh, first construction project that you've been overseeing, but I think we're all excited. I know I personally 
I was at uh, Pacific Park a few weeks ago and kind of looked over the area. I was there to watch some soccer practice, but I looked over the area. It's going to be great. I mean, the, the residents of Glendale are really going to enjoy this pool. So. Okay. Mr. Draymond. I just wanted to also add uh, my thanks to uh, Mr. Chapchin and his department, Mr. Rayhern and, and all concerned, and uh, the public for their input, and it's been a long, long road. We're not there yet, but it's been a long, long road getting to this point. Uh, this was something I heard uh, Council Member Najarian speaking about before I was elected, and when he was mayor, uh, certainly um, led the debate on this issue. Uh, I can remember meetings in during a very, very hot summer down at Pacific Edison and walking around on cement in the heat of the day when it was absolutely roasting out there, and sometimes there weren't many people just because of the heat. But uh, uh, this has been uh, a labor of love, I know, on the part of Councilmember Najarian, and it is, uh, he has uh, kept us on our toes on this issue and uh, even put his goggles up on his... Uh, his uh, nameplate there from time to time to remind us of what the goal is. Anyway, I just wanted to thank you all, and I look forward one day to actually seeing a finished pool. Okay, I have one speaker, Mike Mohill. Mr. Mayor, City Council members. In November 2008, I and several speakers came forward to the City Council and said that the idea of a swimming pool at Pacific Park was a great idea. However, since the City was feeling the effects of the new recession, we, we should put the pool idea on hold. A lot has happened since no November 2008. The one idea is glaring to me is how this Council and the previous Council has chosen to spend the City's money and the results. For approximately two years, many speakers have come forward and asked this council to rein in the city's salaries and pensions. Our request has fallen on deaf ears. Even with 10% unemployment in the city and county, this council has refused to listen to city gadflies. Just a month ago, I asked the city not to pay for the new medical costs for the city workers. But you went right ahead and passed an ordinance helping the city workers. Jan Sakoku pronounce his name right. Head boy aqu aquatics coach at Crescenta Valley High School said in the Glendale News Press back in December 2008, the proposed pool would not meet the aquatic needs of the entire city. A six-lane pool would be useful for a health club with private membership, but will never be sufficient for the community needs. Glendale, Pasadena, and Burbank water polo teams last fall came in first, second, and third place. But it is shame that all the top teams must travel to Burbank to compete for the swimming and water polo championships because Glendale does not have adequate facilities. Again, the question is raised. How come this city of over 200,000 residents, a city manager's salary of over $200,000, managers and middle managers' income over $100,000, could not find the money for an Olympic-sized swimming pool complex be at 10 or 12 lanes. Mr. Mayor, some time ago you said the city had millions of dollars in the reserve account. I guess $8.5 million was chicken feed when you and your colleagues wanted to please your northern constituents. But there is the reserve accounts usage for Glendale, be it for a swimming pool or soccer fields. The, the balance of representation on this dais is glaring. The last city council was comprised of Councilman Weaver and Yusefian living within the quarter of a mile of each other in Glen Oaks Canyon. But there was no council voices southeast or southwest of Glendale. Council members, I ask, is it fair that there are no voices heard from residents who do not live north of the 134 freeway? I do believe these residents pay taxes too. I believe it is time the city to be comprised of council districts, with the southern half of this city having council members representing them at, at the city hall. 
if these residents had a voice on this council, I'm sure there would have be sufficient time. Good old horse trading. Thank you very much for council. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Okay, any comments? Ms. Weaver. Uh, my position hasn't changed on this project. I think it is a good project. It is not an aquatic center. It doesn't even fit the description of it. It's a local pool that is greatly needed. However, I voted before um, to go ahead with the design. And I wouldn't mind doing construction documents, but this is also for construction. Um, as much as we don't want to admit it, Sacramento is not done with us yet. How much more money they're going to take from the city, I don't know. We're sitting here talking three to five hundred thousand dollars annual maintenance operation costs. Where's that coming from? If it's a choice between um, maintenance of a pool and three or five more police officers on the street, I'm going for the police. So while I think it's a great project and deserving project, it should be built because I believe in the kids too. It is not the right time with the fiscal problems that not only this city, but every city in the state faces. I think we have the plans. We like them. We want to do construction documents and set them on the shelf until Sacramento finishes up with us. Fine. But I can't wait to see where we're going to get three to $500,000 a year, new money, on an annualized basis every single year for this project with the economy the way it is in the near future. Any other comments? Ms. Van Jarin. Uh The point, point on the uh, operational costs, although not uh, directly on the agenda, I think need to be uh, addressed. I would uh, recommend and direct staff in anticipation of this pool being completed in May 2012, did you say, 2011? to uh, look at different sources. I may direct you to the LA84 Foundation, which provides operation and maintenance for swimming pools uh, for uh, disadvantaged youth within the particular uh, precincts and zip codes uh, that qualify. The current uh, John C. Argue swimming facility adjacent to the Coliseum is just one of those uh, facilities that obtains uh, quite a bit of their funding from the LA84 Foundation. LA84 Foundation is a, when we had the Olympics in Los Angeles in 1984, uh, there was uh, some leftover money, believe it or not. That money was given to a, a foundation, charitable foundation called LA84, which invested it, uh, continues to invest it, and distributes it uh, throughout the Los Angeles area um, to particular athletic programs which serve underprivileged children. Clearly our location uh, at Pacific Park, I think, would qualify it for that type of funding, if not others being out there. So to get a head start, maybe someone can just start doing a little bit of uh, basic research for the operations and maintenance. Any other comments? Yeah, I think that's a very good idea, Mr. Najarian. For myself, I think this is the right pool, the right uh, size pool for the uh, community and for all of Glendale, not just for the uh, southern or western portion of the city. And I think it's the right time. If we don't do it now, it's uh, when, when are we going to do it? It's been long enough. It's time to move on. Most of the funds for the uh, actual construction have come from different grants, state, community development block grants, etc. So we're not taking money out of our uh, our regular capital uh, improvement funds. Mr. Starbird. Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, keying off of Mr. Najarian's suggestions, we will anticipate preparing an operational plan with alternatives for you uh, for presentation at or before when you uh, decide to go out to bid on the project. So at the time you go to bid, you'll know how and uh, what steps you'll need to take in order to fund its operation. Okay. I need a motion and a second. I'll move the item. Second. Roll call. Second. Mr. Mayor, I, I assume that's the revised motion. The total not to exceed right. cost is $5,000 less on the revised motion. So I'm and assuming it's the revised motion. Yes, I'll adopt that amendment. As indicated by the city attorney. Okay, roll call, please. Council Members Draymond? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Majarian? Yes. Weaver? No. 
Mayor Quintero. Yes. Next, please. And item 8C, Director of Public Works regarding SR-134 San Fernando Road Access and Safety Improvement Program, Fairmont Avenue Extension Project, spec number 3303, Night Work. At 8C1 is a resolution authorizing the provision the provision of a credit and the utility bills to certain eligible residents for the purpose of further minimizing nighttime construction noise. Mr. Starburn. Mr. Mayor, I'll go to Steve Zern, Director of Public Works, for the brief staff report. Steve. Mr. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, in, as we continue with the construction of the Fairmont Bridge of the Fairmont Flyover, as it's uh, been referred to in the 134 San Fernando uh, area, uh, a fairly recent development arose wherein as we crossed over and initiated or began to initiate construction in what was the railroad right-of-way, uh, the right-of-way owned, operated, administered by the railroad through the Southern California Railroad Authority, uh, a request was made of us, a requirement was made of us, that we we'd conduct the majority of that work at night. Um, staff has since then negotiated down to a total of 13 nights, starting somewhere around 24 nights. We got to 16, and, and now we have it down to 13. When we conducted a recent public uh, meeting to go over the night work schedule, a suggestion was made by one of the residents that the city consider a reimbursement of some sort of electrical costs that would be borne by the residents as a result of having to shut their windows and run their air conditioning systems for a, a longer period of time. Construction will be between eight and nine hours each evening. Uh, as a result of that, Ms. Friedman asked us to bring this back to the city council for discussion. And tonight we have, I have Mr. Bagdanian can give you a very short uh, background and then we've given the council, <clears throat> excuse me, some options to consider for the uh, for the reimbursement process. So I'll let Jono, if he would, go over that with you. Then we're available to answer any questions beyond that. Mr. Mayor, member of the City Council, just briefly, the 13 nights that uh, we're planning to do the night work consists of seven nights that will be actually starting tonight. Uh, that will begin most of that work. It will be involving installation of uh, erection of false work. Most of the frames are being done during the day, and then they, they put the false work at night uh, in the proximity of the railroad track within the railroad right-of-way. Uh, two nights uh, in December will be pouring or placing concrete, and two nights in January. And then one night will be in February when once the bridge structure or superstructure is in place, then the false work will be removed. That's a night where it will be on a weekend night uh, where uh, the false work will be removed and there will be complete shutdown of the railroad tracks because there will be no railroad traffic uh, operating at that time given the fact that we have to remove all the false work at that point. Uh, at, as Mr. Zern mentioned, uh, we've looked at the, uh, some criteria as to if the City Council chooses to reimburse the residents for the nighttime uh, activity. Let's say a residence is running their air conditioning unit between 8 to 10 hours a night. Uh, we prepare the criteria, which is in the staff report, that if they're within 500 or 600 feet of the construction area, that's in Exhibit A or B. That's, again, the radius is for Council's uh, consideration. Uh, that uh, we will compensate each resident. Uh, basically, it's a, a dollar an hour based on the rate calculation we receive from the uh, Department of Water and Power. And uh, so uh, if for 13 nights, if you run the air conditioning continuously for 10 hours a night, uh, it will be up to $130 in some form of a credit or a rebate that can be issued to a resident that qualifies within that uh, radius of influence, essentially, for the, uh, during the construction uh, activity that is taking place. Uh, we have prepared a, a resolution and, and a criteria for that. All the residents have to do, essentially, we can help them in sending them a form. They have to fill out and verify that they live in that area. And uh, based on the night of, number of nights of construction, uh, we, will, we can issue a credit uh, toward their utility bill at the conclusion of the construction period. Uh, as I said, it will be up to $130, and depending on what radius we choose, uh, that would be the uh, area of residents who will be qualifying for this. In the resolution, uh, there is a blank area for the radius that council chooses to do so. And then staff will, from there, uh, basically notify the residents and give them the, uh, the credit that is uh, required. Um, 
but they have to meet that cri eligibility criteria that we suggested or recommended the City Council. I'll be happy to answer any more questions if you may have. Mr. Starburn. Mr. Mayor, let me just supplement the staff's comments, uh, which has really been on their part to describe uh, how the council can do this if it, if it wishes. I do have to add from the staff standpoint, we think this is a rather slippery slope that you walk down if indeed uh, you go down this road of approving uh, this sort of a supplement uh, for what is a public works project, which frankly many areas of the community will face in different ways, whether it's street construction, uh, utility construction, or park construction. Inconveniences like these to residences is uh, part of, of living in a community where there's public works projects and improvements going on. Our concern is that uh, others in the community will view this as a precedence. Uh, and a model by which they too, when inconvenienced, uh, should be compensated in some way. Uh, we just believe that's a slippery slope to go down from a public policy standpoint. Uh, it can be done. Uh, it's certainly appropriate if the council wishes, and we've laid out a methodology for doing that. Uh, but we would encourage you to um, give this considerable thought uh, before going down this road. Okay, for myself, I have given a considerable thought and the impact on this neighborhood for a very, very long time is going to just be horrible. All you have to do is drive in the general vicinity and I uh, think there's a difference between this and paving roads and other uh, public uh, works that uh, we do. This is a bridge basically to uh, service the uh, uh, companies located there in uh, that uh, particular project area, Disney, DreamWorks, and other uh, companies. And uh, this neighborhood is basically taking it on the uh, chin. So I think this is the least we can do, quite frankly. It's not much, but, nor will it cost the city much. But uh, I think there's a big difference between this and the other public uh, works projects that we do throughout the uh, city. Mr. Starbird, I mean, Mr. Weaver. That's Mr. Starbird. <laughs> Mr. Weaver, excuse uh, me. General, do you recall offhand, refresh me, how much money we spend on sound isolation in that neighborhood? What was the magnitude of it, or Mr. Zern? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Weaver, the grants received by the 32 homes in that general area was a total of just over $300,000. And then the sound wall extension was the cost was over a million dollars. I believe it was one point two million dollars. That was that was undertaken by Caltrans. That, if I'm taxpayers' dollars. That was right. Taxpayers' dollars. That was a Caltrans project. Okay. And my point uh, being, as I recall, based on decibel readings, none of this from an engineering standpoint, was necessary. The decibel increase in sound, current, and with the project in, didn't rise to that level. The council decided anyhow to go for the sound insulation and the, the um, bridge extension, I mean the uh, sound wall extension. That's a million five hundred thousand dollars of the taxpayers' monies, whether it's city or state, it was not necessary according to the way we calculate impacts to an area. And to now do this, again, as Ms. Durbert said, we're setting precedents. There's nothing in this city that could have been built without creating noise. Every public works project you will ever see is going to create noise, and some of that work is going to be done at night. I'm sure when they built the 134 freeway through Glendale, took out hundreds and hundreds of homes. I'd be willing to bet some of that work was done at night and did impact community. Always has, always will. So I think it sets precedence doing, even though the amount is small. Uh, and then going to run the air conditioning. Well, I think tonight is, what's the temperature going to be tonight down in the 60s? Uh, what's the guarantee you're going to have to run the air conditioning in the next for the next seven, ten days? Um, I think I have a bigger problem with the fact that, as one resident wrote me, they didn't see a problem with, uh, well, saw a problem with giving 
tax rebate or the utility rebate or reduction. Their concern was is the trains now approaching uh, Grandview are laying on their horn the whole way down through Grandview, Flower Street, and clear down past the 134 freeway. And they're sa this individual is saying, because we put Flower Street in, now the trains are honking the horns the whole distance. I think that's the most the more serious thing we ought to be looking at for long term, how we can get the trains to lay off their horns through there. Uh, there's got to be some legal precedent in order for us to do that. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Weaver, with respect to that, as we upgrade uh, all the existing railroad crossing within City of Glendale, as well as working with City of Los Angeles to upgrade theirs, then we will be potentially eligible for a, a quiet zone uh, that we would have to apply. And at that point, then you will have all the safety features in place so that the trains don't have to blow their horn as they enter Glendale or exit Glendale from oh, wait, either north or south. We have to do them all before we can apply? Yes, because of the proximity of these crossings are such that you have to upgrade all of them. Even though, uh, let's say we can upgrade the ones in Glendale, as you're approaching Fairmont or as you're approaching Doran crossing, you still have to blow it for the next one, which is Broadway, Brazil, and then uh, Sonora. So residents down there are going to have train Trevish. noise. From trains approaching Grandview to the, down to Duran. That's correct. Well, we never knew that one before. Mr. Starburn. Well, I was going to point out that uh, th this line of discussion is going to get us, no pun intended, way off track. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. We, we will prepare a report on what's called a quiet zone. Uh, there are considerable obligations uh, for upgrading of tracks into the millions and millions of dollars in order to qualify, however. So uh, to say once the upgrades are complete, we'll qualify, those upgrades are very considerable and way beyond what we currently have budget for upgrades on these crossings. And they've gone up considerably since the uh, Chatsworth uh, train accident. So uh, we'll prepare a report to you with more information, but I, I don't think we can, we can anticipate in the uh, near future uh, the ability to be successful in an application for a quiet zone. Ms. Friedman, followed by Mr. Draymond. Um, Mr. Starbird, I want to thank you for your point. It's well taken. Um, and Mr. Weaver, um, certainly construction projects happen all over the city, and we can't always be trying to placate residents every time that happens. However, I do agree with the mayor that this is an unusual project that's gone on for a very, very long time. Um, with all kinds of inconvenience, um, even though we've done, I think, an amazing job, Public Works has done an amazing job to mitigate a lot of that, um, still there are inevitable uh, impacts to the residents in terms of noise, air quality, um, rerouting of roads, all kinds of things. We had spoke at one point about this not setting a precedent, about being able to frame it in such a way that in order to receive this kind of compensation, the neighborhood, would, the, the project would have to rise to the kind of level of impact that this project did. Is that some, a way that we can work that into the language so that we're very clear that it's not just the repaving of a road or the normal kinds of public works projects? And do you think that that would help uh, prevent this from being the kind of precedent that anybody that had any kind of street work would be able to point to? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we have that language in the recitals clauses now to narrow it down and make it very specific to this project. That certainly doesn't mean someone won't or can't point to it as non-legal precedent for purposes of trying to seek some form of compensation for inconvenience during another construction project. But we have crafted the resolution before you narrowly and very specifically focused on this project. It's absolutely true that very few cities, I think, would go through what the city's gone through to try to mitigate uh, a lot of these effects. I used to live in New York City, and when you live there, you pretty much have to expect that all types of public works, anything is done at night and all night, including trash pickup, which kind of starts at about midnight and, and lasts all night long with the beeping of the horns and all that. But I think it's because we do care about what the residents go through that it makes this the kind of city that it is. So uh, I support this, and I think that that's why people live here. And I just want to really, once again, credit your department with 
going to extraordinary means to make this a palatable project for the residents, including with this particular night work, setting a path so that the trucks can go in loops and don't have to back up and, and do their beeping as much as possible. So I think that that's great, and I do support this, and I hope that it does bring some relief and allows the affected residents to be able to keep their windows shut and block out noise and, and have uh, um, some of the, the impacts of this, you know, maybe be easier to swallow for you. Raymond. Just a couple things, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just want to remind, um, uh, just give this reminder that at one point when we were talking about the night construction and why it was necessary, and what we kept hearing from staff was, you have to understand, this is one of, one of if not the big, biggest project that has ever been done in this city. How many times did we hear that? Over and over and over and over. And now we're hearing it's just kind of uh, any old pro construction project, and it, and it isn't. And it's not just any old area of the city. It's an area of the city where an inordinate amount of construction has been going on and on and on and on. Uh, and, frankly, most of the local residents in this area didn't want this project to begin with spoke out against it vocally at the time, <clears throat> uh, prior to its inception, during its inception, planning, and so on. Um, that's just one thing I wanted to, to mention. The other thing is that the email, Mr. Weaver, that you were referring to, the point of the email, um, and this bolsters your point, not mine, but um, the point of the email was that people who moved there knew there were trains there and should have assumed there would also be all kinds of other construction as a result. Trains make a lot of noise, so if that's the case, then why aren't we compensating everybody that lives in the area because they hear train noise and would have to close the window. But you see, to me, there is a great difference between someone that moves in an area, moves to an area where there is a train, train tracks and train noise, and someone who moves to an area and then every kind of project, including, as we keep hearing from staff, the biggest construction project in, in recent memory is being uh, constructed or some would say perpetrated uh, above their head, around their neighborhood, and it's not just the sound, it's the sound, it's the congestion, it's the dust, it's the debris, it's the hassle factor of having to, to constantly negotiate uh, detours and closed roads and all of that. Um, and. Uh, Let's just be frank. It's not the kind of construction project you're going to see in Ross Moyne or in Glen Oaks Canyon or, uh, you, know, you know, Ross Moyne and Mountain area or Montecito Park or Montrose. You're just not going to see that kind of construction project. And I wonder how we would react if, you know what, we're going to do the biggest project in recent memory and we're going to drive it overhead you know, right through one of our canyon areas, right through Chevy Chase Canyon, I think we might have a little different take. And my last point has to do with, uh, or comment, has to do with the idea of setting precedent. We, we as a council uh, think about this kind of thing a lot, and we discuss it a lot. And I think everybody on this dais, since I've been here, uh, at one point or another has raised the issue of will our actions, no matter which way a vote goes or a debate goes, will it set a precedent, whether it's legal or not. Um, uh, and we, we are concerned about that, and we should be. But you know what, folks? We set precedent with almost every vote we take, one way or another. We take policy one direction. We risk creating some sort of precedent or argument to bolster, uh, or, or uh, action that bolsters someone's argument in the future one way or another. Uh, you could even say, as uh, has been mentioned here, a project up in, in the Montrose area uh, prior where we spent a certain amount of money. Well, that's a precedent. It takes public policy in a particular direction. We say that a swimming pool takes us in another direction. You know, it, it, at a time when things are tight, we're saying it's still important to provide, a, perhaps even more important, to create a quality of life for an area of the city that is densely populated and has no uh, recreational facilities. These are precedents. Um, so anyway, I, I am not so concerned about that. Um, if I see another project in the city while I'm still serving as a city council member that rises to the magnitude of this kind of a project and we can 
button the impact down to a radius like this. We haven't discussed that part of it yet, but a series of, of areas here, whether it's 600 feet or 300 or 150, and we can button it down to a specific number of residents and so on, then I would vote for that too. So that's where I am with it, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Okay, Ms. Weaver. Mr. Starber, do you happen to recall how much money we paid out to um, businesses when we were building the Orange Street Garage? Or loss of business? No, I don't. I don't. For a significant amount of money. Yeah, I really, I really don't recall. And I know that they then came back afterwards and said they needed more money. And we finally said, wait a minute. If we start going down this path, we're going to have, every time we do anything on brand or whatever, we will have businesses putting their hand out and wanting more money. So, well, Mr. Graham, you might be right. In, in one particular area, there are others. And I have that historical perspective to know what happened there. We just got to watch the traps we may Sure. Possibly fall into. Okay, I have one speaker, Mike Mohill. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. This is a toughie for all five of you people. It really is. Uh, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. You can you can please some people. You can displease other people. Uh, the comment going down a slippery road, whatever you want to call it, is very true. Um, when, for example, they built the, the soccer complex and there were trucks going up and down Fern Lane, did those residents get compensated for that? When we go ahead and did the remodeling on Brand Boulevard, did those businesses get compensated for those noises? I mean, it goes on and on. When we put in a freeway, <coughs> Do the residents along the freeway get compensated? There's no easy answer. Uh, and then what happens is if you do have an answer, Mr. Attorney Scott Howard is going to, City Attorney is going to say, hey, we have a legal precedence now and he won't come after us. And it's going to cost the city millions, not thousands, but millions of dollars. So I think what the city has to do is if we're going to make any type of compensation, it has to be very narrow. So it doesn't come back and bite us. Because, you know, those residents, uh, I mean, if I lived over there, I wouldn't like it. I mean, think about your own personal experience. You have an air conditioner, a, a compressor outside your yard. We're having a barbecue, and it goes on. Everybody knows the, the air conditioner is on, don't they? And it's annoying for maybe a couple of minutes. But these people have been experiencing this for hours, days, minutes, months. So you have a tough one to call. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, how about the uh, radius? The options are five, six hundred uh, feet. About me, Mr. Mayor. Oh, Attorney Jerry. <clears throat> Maybe you don't want to hear what I have to say. Um, I can see that clearly the votes are lined up to approve this, so I won't be as uh, otherwise as zealous as I would if I thought I had a chance to convince anybody. Uh, and it's not about the money, because the money involved is really not a large amount. Uh, I really think that it's about the principle uh, and it's about the precedent that we're setting. <laughs> Uh, but before I say anything further, uh, Mr. Howard, as a member of uh, MetroLink who gave the orders to the city not to do construction during the day, uh, am I conflicted in any manner? Did the board of directors provide any of this, or was it strictly ministerial? It's all set to staffing level, so this wasn't a board decision. I don't think it was a board resolution. It was. It, 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 it's not a financial interest. It would be, the only issue that comes to mind would be potentially the doctrine of incompatibility, common law doctrine of incompatibility, perhaps, where you're essentially serving two masters in conflicting roles. And it doesn't sound like that's apparent here from what limited information that's been presented. Okay. Um, and we talk about precedent. And if we 
afford the residents of Grange and Grant and Dale an electrical discount because they had to close their windows because of the noise um, and they had to run their air conditioners as a result um, who's next uh, I've received several letters emails from folks that live in La Crescenta and they're asking the question we see that council is voting on this this weekend or this this week uh, let's watch closely and if council affords a utility discount to the folks in the affected neighborhood because they had to close their windows and therefore run their air conditioners why not us we were the victims near victims of a uh, terrible fire that caused uh, noxious poisonous fumes to be spewed into our entire neighborhood and valley we had to close our windows we had to run our air conditioners should we not afford those people the same benefits that we're affording to the folks uh, in the affected neighborhood here who for 13 nights have to close their windows and run their air conditioners there's a, the email that Mr. Uh, Weaver referenced the folks that live along the railroad tracks and because the city put through Flower Street crossing the train engineer has to now blow his horn continuously due to the relative uh, proximity of the crossings should they not be allowed a subsidy because they have to close their windows and those windows have to be closed I think many more nights than just the 13 nights that we're talking about for the affected neighborhoods um, this neighborhood as I understand was afforded uh, directly three hundred thousand dollars in noise attenuation for double paned windows for previous uh, construction I mean, that is a lot I think that's pretty generous uh, and it wasn't a huge number of homes it was about 30 homes each home perhaps up to ten thousand dollars in a uh, in a grant or a subsidy or a rebate uh, in that regard um, how about the the resident that lives next to the fire station who is awakened in the middle of the night because the fire department has to respond to a call they're certainly their sleep is no less precious than those that live in the affected neighborhoods they are woken up uh, perhaps at a much greater date a greater number of uh, evenings than the folks that would be here for 13 nights should they not also be afforded some subsidy because they have to close their windows and they have to run their air conditioner um, to bring it close to home every Friday mr. Zern every Friday at 6 a.m. your darn trash trucks come by with their loud CNG engines and screeching brakes and roar of the hydraulic arm and lift up that garbage can and dump it in and bang it down and then they stop at the neighbor's house one house over and then all the way up the street and on Fridays I don't get any sleep unless I close my windows and I run my air conditioning and keep it set at the thermostat level so the question is where do you draw the line we are being watched right now by several communities along the railroad tracks certainly in La Crescenta to see where we're acting I think we're setting a, a bad precedent and we set precedents all the time but the precedent we're setting here is paying money from the city for inconvenience and disturbances caused by our projects so I can really not support uh, this item then mr. Drain. the reason that the city I think it's proper for the city in this case to give this credit it's the same reason that when a developer is doing a large project that has an impact on the neighbors of that project they prepare an environmental impact report and out of their own pocket have to mitigate those impacts whether it's by putting in a new sidewalk or doing sound protection or anything else the reason that it's proper for the city to issue this credit is because first of all this is a project that the city's undertaking and that's different from something like a fire where fire wasn't something that we caused and the reason it's different from mitigating an effect let's say from a fire station is because 
that fire station is benef benefiting the community that's being disrupted. In this case, this community, you could argue, is not being benefited from this work. This work is being done for a business that's very important to the city, um, but it may not be so important to the people who are being kept up at night. So it's very different from a fire truck or a garbage truck or anything else that's benefiting the people that are being disrupted by it. Um, and unlike other construction projects that are going on in the city, how long is the duration of this project from, in terms of the actual construction? This is over a two-year project. Two-year period that, as one of my colleagues pointed out, has affected everything in this neighborhood from traffic patterns to dust to um, noise, night and well, day and now night. So it's unlike a lot of the other projects, except maybe the original building of the 134 highway and the 210 highway. And if those people at the time whose lives were disrupted from those were not adequately compensated, they should have been. In the same way that when people were displaced from Chavez Ravine, they should have been compensated. So um, I, this is not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money for the city. We're talking about a couple hundred dollar credit. It's not a lot of affected homes here. But my feeling is that, in some ways, it's sort of the least we can do. And we have done for them. But at the time that that original amount of money was given for the soundproofing of their homes and, and all of the other types of things, I don't, if I heard you correctly, Mr. Zern, we didn't anticipate this kind of night work. So that wasn't taken into account. We thought that the work would all be done during the day. So perhaps if we had realized that there would have been night work, that amount of money might have been different. I mean, I don't know. Um, I wasn't here then. Um, but it's pretty common that develop either private developers or city developers, when there's impacts to be mitigated, have to do that. And to me, this just this is an extension of that. It's not a new policy. It's something that environmental impact reports often lead to different types of mitigation. And this is just more of that. So, if somebody came in and was talking about just you know noise from their trucks, I think that's a completely different situation. And I think that anybody who's hearing this would realize that two years of nonstop construction is a pretty unusual situation and that if they were in the shoes of, of these residents that maybe their patients would have been stretched pretty thin by this point. Mr. Drain. Well, much of what I was going to say was just said. Um, I would only add that the slight distinction I'd make is that uh, uh, things like natural disasters, uh, acts of God, uh, normal uh, public works, you know, collection of uh, trash and uh, fire stations and and uh, civic works and things of that sort. Again, these are are things people. I think a reasonable person understands when they buy a house next to a fire station that eventually a fire engine is going to come out of the firehouse with its siren going. I mean, we people we have to assume that there's some reasonable intelligence on the part of our our residents and. And uh, I, that is a very different thing than the city of Glendale deciding that to benefit a particular corporation, a uh, business entity, all, albeit, as Councilmember Friedman put it, important to the city, uh, and that this is going to be ongoing for a period of years at an intense rate, uh, that, uh, that the two are equal. They are just, in my mind, simply not. I understand it's an argument that... that um, that one can can make uh, that it is a reasonable argument. I just don't agree with it, and and I can't support that. But I would, at the same time, compliment my colleagues on a very interesting debate. It has been a very interesting debate. Mr. Najarian, the uh, the only thing that I want, would like to respond to um, is the statement that this construction does not benefit. Uh, the residents and that it only benefits a particular corporation. Well, just just this afternoon, we were talking about how those two corporations are the anchors and the driving force behind our vision for a redevelopment of San Fernando Road as a creative arts district. So, in a sense, uh, that flyover is benefiting the entire neighborhood. A strong Disney and a strong DreamWorks will bring in those prop houses and will bring in those ancillary artistic uh, related businesses to help the entire San Fernando 
corridor. So. Let me just clarify that what I said was that you could make the argument that, or that these residents might not believe it helps them. I personally think that having Disney in the area is going to be a huge benefit to the area. But they may not agree. <laughs> and having spoken to them, I think that some of them don't agree. So um, I do think that Disney being there is going to be very good for the area, and I think that at some point, uh, you know, as they become more integrated into the, the area there, that we'll all see that, and hopefully the neighborhood will reap a lot of those benefits. Mr. Train, uh, Mr. Train. Yeah, one last thing I would add to, to that um, about needs and desires. Uh, many business entities desire a great many things. It doesn't mean that it is necessarily beneficial to the community. Uh, nor does it mean that they wouldn't operate without it. I mean, uh, Disney happens to want this flyover. doesn't mean that had the answer been no early on, that Disney would have folded their tent and left Glendale. Uh, as a matter of fact, I know many, many employees at Disney on all sorts of levels, uh, <laughs> all sorts of positions within the company, who have told me that in their, their opinion, not interested in this flyover, wouldn't use it anyway. Uh, but their comment was, off the record, you know, what Disney wants, Disney gets. So, anyway, I, I just I, I just think that's just, in my opinion, a non-starter. Um, to take it into the realm of saying uh, we wouldn't have them as an anchor, a business anchor, uh, if, uh, if they didn't have the flyover. It just makes, okay. I mean, you know. For uh, those members who are going to uh, vote for the item, um, is there interest in the 500-foot radius or 600-foot radius? The difference is uh, approximately seven uh, residences more are covered under the 600-foot uh, radius. Mr. Draymond. Well, I feel pretty comfortable uh, with a radius that we use otherwise to constitute a neighborhood. Uh, we use it for a different reason, I mean, in a different context, I should say. But um, so I believe that radius is what? Uh, 500. 500. Yeah, so that would be hey, the. Hey, Ms. Freeman? It's fine. All right, do I have a motion and a second? Okay. Unless, you want to, well, unless you want to parse each section of the resolution separately, you also have two other points that probably need to be made. One is that the original resolution noted a $104 uh, cost to the city based on a flat rate of $8 per night. I understand in speaking with Mr. Zern that the contractor has asked for two more hours, which brings it to the $130 figure that uh, Mr. Bagdanian mentioned. And so that would need to be changed uh, again with the, uh, uh, with the approval of the majority of the council. Instead of $104, it would be $130 based on a flat rate of $10 per night. Um, for operating a five-ton air conditioner for 10 hours, not eight hours. And you have the alternative about uh, whether you've got the flat rate or that each individual would provide um, actual documented expenditures for air conditioning electrical usage. Mr. Raymond. Well, I'm going to address something else, but um, I would for just a flat rate. But let me, as for, for myself, but let me just... Also, I have a question that may, of course, cut counter to my my opinion anyway, but uh, I just want to raise the issue. What happens if uh, we take this vote this evening and, uh, and we approve this, and next week we hear from the contractor and they say, oh, guess what, if we're back up to 15 nights, or, you know what, now that you guys have had this, this rapprochement with the neighborhood there, we want an extra week. Because you guys can just compensate them. What happens then? As well, what if the temperatures dip below the level that you need air conditioning for? The resolution as currently crafted is very focused on 13 events of night work. And again, it's written in the alternative, either flat rate, $130 based upon 10 hours a night for 13 nights, or documented uh, electric um, expenditure, electric utility expenditures. If, based upon the way this dra resolution is drafted, there were to be changes in that schedule, increasing, for example, the number of nights, we would have to come back to the city council. What if we decrease the number of nights? Same thing. Same thing. 
Same thing. Right now, the way it's crafted is based upon the firm number of 13 nights at anticipating 10, 10 hour a night. So would it make more property. sense to word it and do it by the night? That's a way if it was a day less or a day more, it would just automatically adjust? You could do that. Uh, again, uh, it, it, right now, from what I understand, and Mr. Zern can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the plan would be to work throughout an entire 10-hour night based upon the contractor. I don't know, for example, if the contractor has would extend it two more nights but only want to work two hours per night. Uh, and so you've got those variables, and certainly if you want to delegate that to staff, we can deal with it. But we'd have to include language in the resolution to address that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I can. Starling. It does seem to me that, that on the two items, you know, what if there's a slight change in the schedule? And should we have people produce documentation at some point, the amount of management and handholding is going to far exceed the entire cost of this, and it wouldn't take much to do that. My suggestion would be that uh, this be crafted in a way that, based on what we what we anticipate will happen, but acknowledging there may be slight variations in that, that this be a sort of a blanket uh, compensation or offset for the inconveniences and noise. And if there's a one or two day variation one way or the other, so be it. Because this, I, I think, admittedly, this money is more, both from the resident standpoint and the city standpoint, this this uh, this is more an effort to show good faith and not to actually get down to calculating dollars and cents and true true costs of inconvenience. So, in that way, uh, we wouldn't have to manage all the paperwork, uh, nor if there's a, a slight two-day variation one way or the other, we wouldn't have to come back to you and make an adjustment. I may add that we have a, a calculated hourly rate, too, which even makes it a little bit easier. You can just go by the actual number of hours we worked, which is pretty easy for us. And that's less or more. We A little bit less or a little bit more, we can adjust that. Mr. Trayman. Well, the reason, and this was, you, you're dragging out of me the reason mm -hmm. why I think it should be a flat rate, and that is because right now, Mr. Zern, we have all kinds of uh, disagreements cropping up where we say, hey, they were only out there. You know, two hours, and the residents say, uh-uh, no, this went on for from this period of time to this period of time, uh, and um, I just, I'm just, for, for the amount of money we're talking about, I'm just personally not interested in, in that. We get into a, well, we know how long our contractors are there. Well, you might think you do, but they were out there. Well, actually, they were off the clock, but they were just moving the equipment, or you know, or they're not on the clock yet, they're just getting into position, and we get into this semantic game of of what constitutes work hours and what doesn't, and, and it just sounds like a lot of uh, slaughtering of brain cells to me. I also agree the flat rate makes more sense. Cleaner. Mr. Howard. Yes, Mr. Mayor, just so I, I understand, the ordinance is currently drafted, at least with the alternative that everyone seems to be focusing on, is $130 based on a flat rate of $10 per night for 13 events. No. If we're looking, I'm sorry, correct, 13 events for night for 10 hours uh, for running and operating a five-ton AC unit. If we're looking at potentially just a another alternative would be a $130 flat rate for events of night work anticipated for the for project, not specifically 13 days. So if it turns out to be 13 and a half nights or 12 and a half, it's still $130. Or if they don't need the full 13, it turns out 12. Or if they need one day more, it still doesn't change. It's a flat rate of $130. That's my suggestion. Okay, that's fine with me. We'll just we'll delete the number of events and we'll just note for night work anticipated for the project. All right. Do I have a motion for this, uh, or is it an ordinance? You said it's a resolution, sir. Resolution. Okay. With those, with those. I need a motion. Move the item. No second. With the uh, with the flat rate as as stated, and with 500 feet as the uh, radius. Roll call. Council members Drayman. Yes. Friedman. Yes. Najarian. No. Weaver. No. Mayor Quintero. Yes. Next, please. We will return to oral communications. Discussion is limited to five minutes. Council may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. The city manager may refer the matter to the appropriate department for investigation and report. Can I have the cards, please? Oh, I'm sorry.
Okay, Michael Arbuckle, followed by Bill Wiseman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members and staff members. Again, I have the privilege of speaking on the behalf of the Ivy Glen Tennis Association. Tonight, my specific uh, uh, premise is to acquaint you with what we have done recently. It became, uh, to our knowledge, because of how you spoke uh, after I spoke last uh, meeting, that you were under the impression that everything is okay, and you were surprised that I was back speaking and that there were further uh, problems at the building. And so we want to be fair, and we want to follow the HUD rules. We have, we believe, we have totally, as the Tenants Association, actually worked with this new management in good faith and tried to be cooperative in every way that it does not actually violate our actual civil rights under either federal, state, or local ordinances. And so we had a meeting on Friday of the Tenants Association. All six of that time, 16 of the apartments were representative, and which consisted of a quorum. And therefore, we afterwards took a interview with the people who did not come and attend that meeting. And so far, we have actually gone through that interview with four more individuals. So a total of 20 out of 23 apartments and of tenant members have been polled. And of that poll, we have asked them, we asked them specific questions. One, do you feel everything is supposedly okay between the tenants and the current management and their way of managing? Of those 20s that have been so far polled, 17 said, no, it is not okay. Everything is not hunky-dory. Everything is not all right between this current management and the tenants. We further asked them, do you wish that the officers of the Tenant Association continue to bring to the City Council's attention and to any other organization's attention actual violations? We actually put it that way. We're not here again, as, we, as I explained last week, to continue the, the process of trying to get back the old manager. Now our only concern is where they actually violate actual civil liberties or rights of tenants, whether it be federal, state, or local ordinances or laws that they're violating. And again, 17 out of the 20 so polled, and we will continue to poll the other three that remain to see their response, said yes, we want the current uh, leadership to continue those fights and to continue bringing to the attention of the appropriate agencies where violations actually occur. We also ask them, since again, Ability First, and they're trying to interfere with the working of the Tenants Association, specifically told them that I, their spokesperson, could not speak. We could not, I could not speak for them before you or even before them, and so we took a vote. Do you okay the, the officers of the Tenant Association to actually have a spokesperson? Again, 17 said yes. We also want to bring to your attention that at a recent meeting on August 28 between the tenants and the management, they specifically said to us regarding the Armenian-speaking uh, residents that we've worked it out with them. We will go to their family members. We will not write notices on Armenian so they can understand what's going on. We will not have uh, actual interpreters at any joint meetings. And by the way, at that meeting, there sits the Armenians sitting there who only speak Armenian and hardly any English, not knowing what was going on or said that we will not do, that we will work through their families and every single one of those uh, Armenian tenants have okayed that we work through their families instead of writing notices or providing a uh, interpreter. So we asked them, again, at the tenant Association meeting, because we provided a interpreter at our meeting. This is what they said to us. Do you agree that you made uh, arrangements with the management 
that your family members will speak on your behalf so they don't have to write notices and all that. Every single one said no. We told them that we want the notices, that we're adults and you deal with us direct. Our family members are too busy to come every time there's a meeting. So again, that's where it's at. They seem to have lied. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Wiseman followed by Mike Mohill. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, and City staff. My name is Bill Weissman, uh, station fire evacuee from far north Glendale. <laughs> uh, you had the opportunity last week to have Chief Scoggins uh, reporting to you uh, on the, uh, the response uh, from the, the Glendale Fire Department to the station fire. Uh, I was still a little too uh, stressed out at to, to come down last week, but I did want to come down this week to comment on uh, the extreme professionalism and competence that was shown during this fire by all of the city departments uh, that were involved. Uh, we're extremely grateful and extremely thankful uh, for the support we got. And I'm not going to ask you for any money to subsidize our air conditioning, even though we did have to keep it on uh, 24 hours a day for about a solid week there um, to keep uh, the inside of the house habitable and from filling with smoke. And But the station fire was not a discretionary act by the city of Glendale. So... Uh, was wasn't planning on asking for any reimbursement for that. Uh, we uh, had a chance to observe things kind of build up starting on Wednesday, August uh, 26th, when uh, Ericsson Air Crane helicopter, which is one of those very ungainly, on aerodynamic flying giant flying insect things, uh, refueled at the helipad up at uh, next to Duke Magian Park. Um, on Thursday the 27th, they had placed a big yellow dip tank up there, which was used continuously during the station fire. Um, L.A. County Fire Department had an engine. They attached a hose running down to the hydrant next to the access road, and that tank was filled with water, and dozens and dozens of, of helicopter missions were flown uh, out of there that we got to witness personally since they kept us awake all day and all night while they were going on. But, you know, that's one of the things that's necessary uh, in a crisis like this. On Saturday, when we got evacuated, the first phone call we got was from our friend who lives down in Spar Heights. And he said, you know, I'm watching GTV6 right now, and they just declared evacuation for north of Santa Carlotta, where you live. A few minutes later, the second phone call came from Officer Matt Zakarian of the Glendale Police Department, who is our local community uh, policing officer. And the reason he called us is because we manage several mailing lists for residents in the area, for our homeowners group, and for the CB Community Association and other things. So as soon as we got that call, we started putting out the word uh, on our email lists. The third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh calls we got were all reverse 911 calls and um, the reverse 911 system does work very well um, I have to say this is the first time uh, I've experienced it and uh, it uh, was able to handle whether it a live person picked up or whether an answering machine picked up so it was very gratified uh, to see that. Also need to thank our neighbors across the street who own a rental house in Verdugo City and it just so happened that their tenants had moved out and they just came to us and handed us the keys and said take the cats and go which is what we did. When we left we, I shut off the gas um, I left all the doors unlocked to the house and I did so without worrying about any looting or anything like that because we had Glendale police officers posted at every single intersection along Santa Carlotta leading up into our neighborhoods. And those officers were there from Saturday afternoon when the evacuation happened until, I believe, Tuesday morning. And I saw Sergeant Smith and his motor officers up there. I don't know how much overtime it ended up. It seemed like half the Glendale police force was in our neighborhood for about four days. And they did an absolute excellent job at uh, security out there. They were very uh, good about making sure that only residents uh, were able to get up into the neighborhood. They uh, 
in comparison with our neighbors to the city of L.A. and unincorporated county, uh, we were served very well, not only by the police, the Glendale Fire Department, and thank you, Chief Scoggins, for, for saving that oak tree in Dupagian Park. Uh, the Parks and Rec people, the Glendale Rangers, I know Parks and Rec has their climbing wall and their trailer up at Duke Magian. They had to store it for a while on the street in front of Dave Ahern's house while the backfires were being set uh, on Monday. Glendale Water and Power with their uh, robocall about electricity usage. Public Works came and picked up our trash on Monday when all of this was going on. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would also mention the Emergency Operations Center. It is so good to be able to call and speak to a live person, which I did multiple times. They took my name and phone number in case they needed to get back to me. I just basically wanted to say uh, thank you very much for a job well done, and the residents uh, in our area truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weisman. Mike Mohill, followed by David Myers. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Mike Mohill, resident of Glendale. I'd like to thank the five Council Members for the dedicated work you all do every week. I know it's not easy taking the abuse from people like myself and others. However, it's part of your job. I remember when Glendale was a small, sleepy town of about 100,000, and we were pretty a homogeneous town. Everybody kind of like looked like each other. Everybody had the same interest. But today we are a city of over 200,000 people with different interests and different likes and dislikes. I look up here and I see people who live well, let's see. Mr. Weaver lives in Glen Oaks Canyon. Mr. Draymond lives in up Montrose. Mr. Quintero lives in North Glendale. Mrs. Friedman lives in North Glendale. And Mr. Najarin lives a little bit north of Glen Oaks Canyon. But there's nobody here representing Central Glendale, Southeast Glendale, or Southwest Glendale. Why? Don't these voters count? They pay their taxes like everybody else. But when it comes to representation, the people who live south of the 134 freeway have, do not have a voice at the table here. It seems that all the goodies primarily go north of the 134 freeway. I'm repeating myself when I talk about the Rock Haven Sanitarium conversion, $8.5 million. And the people south of the 134 freeway get about a $6 million water hole for a swimming pool, not a swimming complex that they deserve, or a soccer complex that they deserve also, like they have in North Glendale. Had there been people from the, if we, if we had districts, I propose we change the charter that we have seven electric, elected people from seven regions of the city, and each one of them would represent about 30,000 people. They would be highly paid. They would be professional. So they would have time to talk with, go out to the constituents and find what the needs are. It wouldn't be a part-time job because your job is not part-time. We want you to be part-time, but we want you also to work full-time at a part-time salary. I understand you people, excuse the language, make between thirty six and forty thousand dollars a year. Not a lot of money for part time when you put in a full time jail. Our city manager gets over two hundred thousand and our managers and sit middle managers make over a hundred thousand dollars each. I propose that our council members make about as much as our city managers. Why not? You work very, very hard. I might not agree with you, as you all well know. However, I know you, got, you all are dedicated civil servants. By having council districts, there would be more horse trading, as they would say, and that's good. Because right now, if somebody wants something south of the 134 freeway, someone in the north would say, hey, what's in it for me? That's how council districts work in Pasadena, in Los Angeles, 
I think Glendale is too big to be treated like a, a one-horse town because we're more than that. We have the Americana. We're big now. And we ought to act like one of the big boys, not like a little boy anymore. <coughs> By paying our people, our councilmen, more money, having smaller districts, and term limits, by the way, 10 years maximum, we will join many other cities in the reform movement, which will also improve the quality of life reports for the city and keep Glendale in front of the news and not behind the eight ball. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Again, I believe, council members, you all work very hard. Thank you again for your dedication. Thank you, Dave Myers. Good evening, city staff, city council members. My name is David Myers, and I'm here tonight not as a representative of any particular group, but as a resident of Glendale that wants, wants to say thank you to everyone for a job well done during these last couple of weeks. Mr. Starbird, you have obviously placed the right people in the right place who responded at the right time. The response and collaboration with the Crescenta Valley was well orchestrated without much notice. How amazing it was that not one home in Glendale was lost as we all watched in awe as our beloved hillsides burned to the ground. The organization of the city was well demonstrated as various departments were faced with challenge upon challenge during this dire strait of emergency. From the heroic firemen on the front lines of the fire, the police force who maintained the order, the public works department who were on scene ensuring power was not lost, the IT department who kept us current on Channel 6 and on the web, and everyone else behind the scenes who facilitated a smooth operation during what have, could have been chaos. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for doing their jobs not just doing their jobs, but doing extraordinary jobs during their extraordinary time. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes oral communications. Any comments? Ms. Friedman. Um, I want to first of all um, thank the members of the public who came to give their thanks to the city, and I want to echo those. I wasn't here last week, but I was here during the fire and spent some time in the Emergency Operations Center, not because I had a role to play, but more as an observer. And I will tell you that I was extremely, um, not just proud to live in Glendale, but relieved to live in Glendale. When I saw the difference between the, respond and the response that we were able to get out to our neighborhoods and the way that our police department and fire departments were able to protect our neighborhoods compared to what was happening in neighboring cities and in the unincorporated county areas. I was very, very grateful to be living in this city. So I want to, to echo um, your thanks. And I would just like to make a comment about Mr. Mohill's um, suggestions. Um, the idea of districts certainly has come up over the years, and there's pros and there's cons. But one thing I definitely don't agree with is that the people in the south part of the city don't have representation. They do have representation up on this dais. You don't have to live in a particular area to represent it or to feel connected to it. Um, I was very happy to have gotten a tremendous amount of votes in a lot of areas that I didn't live in or that I don't live in, areas in the south of the city and areas in the far north of the city, far from where my actual home is. And even though we are a growing city and a large city, we're not so huge that I think that we can't understand the issues all around the city and represent those people. And certainly, people in every area do have an opportunity to elect officials because no matter where you live in the city, your vote, vote counts equally. People in the south part of the city's vote counts just as much as people in the north part of the city. And my one fear with districts is that we limit our choices. Um, if we had districts, it's possible that we couldn't have all of us up here because some of us live in close proximity to each other. I live fairly close to the mayor, so it might probably would be one or the other of us. So we limit people's choices. We don't expand them. Um, and I hope that during my time on this council that I can 
do a better job of representing all the people and all the constituents of the city. And that's my personal goal. And um, so I, I hope that no one in the city feels that they're not represented because I think all of us up here do our best to, to represent each and every single interest in each and every area. You have a comment? Mr. Starber. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, just a quick one. Um, thanks to Mr. Wiseman and Mr. Myers for uh, their acknowledgement of the, of the work that was done during the fire. I would point out, reference was made to uh, the call that Mr. Weissman got returned when he called the EOC. Actually, something that we don't implement uh, every time we, we implement the Emergency Operations Center, but we did in this case, is we implemented an Emergency Information Center. Really two separate operations that went on at the same time. One in the basement of City Hall, which is our Emergency Operations Center. The other, the Emergency Information Center, which was, which was established over in the Police Department and staffed by Community Development and Housing and the City Clerk's Office, 24 hours a day during the entire event, and literally became the Information Center for the broader La Crescenta area, uh, area in the county, City of L.A., uh, there were actually other agencies giving out our telephone number as a source of information to call because they were doing such a good job of getting information from our informational staff and then making it available to the public. Tremendous resource. Uh, kind of the unsung heroes are the, are the folks that are in the EIC, again, 24-7, manning telephones, finding out the information, and relaying it and giving people comfort. But thank you for your thanks. I'm in, Mr. Draymond. I just wanted to uh, echo one comment that uh, Councilmember Friedman had made. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, councilmanic districts. It has to do with what constitutes representation and so on. Some years ago, when I was uh, at the at the uh, podium, come here for on a variety of issues uh, to speak. Uh, I believe uh, Council Member Gomez sat in the chair that uh, Council Member Najarian is sitting in right now. Um, he lived in South Glendale. South Glendale represented then. I guess by by the example we were given, yes, by virtue of the fact simply that he lived there. I believe Mr. Gomez uh, did represent all of, all of the interests of the cities. Uh, prior to the 2007 election, uh, no one had ever been elected from La Crescenta, and a portion of La Crescenta from the city uh, on the city council. We had had one appointee in the 50s and finished out a term, but no one had ever been elected. So was was uh, the Glendale Annex, uh, was La Crescenta not represented? Their interests were not represented. Also, what's the, what's the, uh, the um, statute of limitations for where you live? I lived for 10 years in South Glendale. Does that mean that when I moved from there, that I lost all interest in, the, in that area, or while I was living there, I only had their interests while I was living there. I also lived for a considerable amount of time in, I guess, what would be sort of considered the north-central part of the city. Right around Stalker, I lived on Columbus Avenue. So was I only a representative of that area at the time? Um, as some of my colleagues know, uh, right now I'm not living in the Montrose area because of a uh, uh, a flood in my home. So now I'm living temporarily in a different part of the city. So do I no longer represent uh, the Montrose area or La Crescenta because of that? Of course not. I understand what I understand what the speaker is trying to say, but I just want to clarify for the public that it isn't as simple as just where you live. I think we all try to balance uh, the interests of our greater constituency, which is the residents of the city of Glendale. In terms of councilmanic districts, I'll just say I've always been on the record for supporting that, and I think I am the only one on the dais that uh, has consistently uh, supported that, but that's a different debate for a different time. Mr. Weaver. Back in the 80s, Ginger Bremberg and I, and I forget, wasn't it you? <laughs> National League of Cities? Pointing to Frank Quintero. Yes. The record so <laughs> yes, and my presentation was on what we had done in South Glendale as a city. We were one of the finalists. And I think there was the number something like $35 million or something that had already been spent into the 80s. An astronomical amount more than been spent in the rest of the city at the time. 
so. the infrastructure and other needs in in South Glendale. To anyone suggesting that we don't care about South Glendale, the facts just don't support it. You remember when we did that? It was the first time I met Mr. Weaver on that particular trip to the uh, League of Cities and. Uh, that with your wife? I made yeah. a presentation specifically on South Glendale. As for myself, I spent 28 years of my life working with the residents of South uh, Glendale and the business owners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, while you didn't do it tonight, Mr. Mohill, I always get a kick out of people that come to that podium and talk about South Glendale and talk about all of the needs and all of the issues and that we don't pay attention. I don't know where they were those, well, let's call it 25 years. I don't know where they were for 25 years while I was working in that uh, community, but uh, that's that's the way it is. Okay, any other comments? Next, please. Is there any new business? No. Will we adjourn? We are adjourned.